Hello and welcome to the Marina Skewer podcast. My name's Marina and I'm recording in Bath, a city in the southwest England where I live and work. Uh, this is a podcast about craft and making, mostly knitting. I'm a dyer and spinner of yarns. Um, I'm a knitting tech editor and sort of baby designer. So I've just started out designing, well, just started out designing knitwear properly so that I'm actually publishing it so that other people can make it. Um, so yes, it's been another month since I recorded it actually feels a lot longer um, because we've had a bit of a crazy month. We had a lot of snow as you've seen um, in the intro there. It was absolutely beautiful and that lasted a couple of days before all melting away. Um, and since then, you know, we've had storms and gorgeous sunny days. Today's just very boring and overcast. Um, and here I am being very English and talking about the weather. Um, now we're going to talk about knitting. So, uh, first up are the things I finished. You will have noticed that I am wearing this jumper, which if you've been watching the podcast before, um, thank you very much for coming back. Um, this is a jumper I've been working on for uh, since about Ma March last year, I think. Um, I have had to undo and redo various bits of it, but it is finally finished. Uh, which I'm very excited about. So I love the yoke design. I'll stand up so you can see a bit better there. Um, I had to redo the sleeves a couple of times, but I'm really pleased with how they've turned out. I love the wrist details. Um, it is a little bit tight in the body. Uh, it rides up a tiny bit. Um, and you know, it, it's sort of quite, it just stretches out the color work a bit. And I think it causes the yoke to ride up sometimes so I sometimes get little ridgy bits around here um, but if I just sort of tug it down at the sleeves occasionally it tends to work out um, so it is I hadn't made a yoke jumper before this one um, and did decide to design one for my first one which is always a fun way to do things um, but you know I need to be able to do the maths and because I'm often checking other people's maths and grading for tech editing, uh, it's good to keep myself in practice and do it uh, for my own designs. Um, so this one, I think because of like, or also because of the way the yarn worked out, like I didn't have enough green to do all the body and sleeves in green, which I would have liked to do. Um, so I think in future, I might take another go at this one. Um, once I've got some good wear out of it, like obviously I'll keep wearing this one, but um, I think I'll give it another go and try and iron out the issues that are bugging me um, and then make something really nice. And maybe at that point I'll think about publishing the pattern. Um, and yeah, so two more finished objects, which are actually patterns that I'm publishing. The first up, I showed this one last time, so it's a shawl in my Kaya baby alpaca yarn. Um, the shawl is called Sunder and it's super soft. As you can see, it's got lovely drape to it. Um, it's really easy to wear. It just wraps around like that, or you can tie it under there to keep the ends out the way. Uh, you can also wear it where you sort of wrap it around like that and then pass the ends through and it just has this I mean it's mostly the shape is to kind of avoid like maximize neck and chest warmth and avoid unnecessary bulk in the end so these are quite skinny little ends um, which I really like and so it means they don't get in the way and sort of end up accidentally dipping in your coffee and things um, so it's a neat little shape so it starts at one end is worked to the middle where it gets wider and wider and wider and then it gets skinnier and skinnier so you can see it's got like these little sort of fins here which are quite fun um, so it's a super simple knit um, I've, I've done most of this like in front of the TV 
or at knit night. Um, it's basically ribbing with some increases and decreases and so it's very very easy. Um, so the pattern is written to be super simple for beginners, like I have gone to some effort to sort of explain how the pattern is set up, you know, so the first two stitches of every row will be this, the last two stitches of every row, row will be this. This is how you integrate the increases and decreases into the ribbing pattern. So if you've only ever knit a rectangle before, I'm hoping that this will be sort of a nice accessible pattern um, for something a little bit more adventurous. Uh, so I do have test knits open for it at the moment. Uh, so if you're interested, um, I'll be putting a link in the description box below to my test knitting page and I am offering 30% off the Kaya Baby Alpaca yarn that it is designed for if you choose to use the yarn. It uses four skeins and they're 50 gram skeins so it's just under 200 grams in total um, and like that's a much more generous discount than I would usually give on anything because I, uh, well you know, a lot of work goes into my yarn but also a lot of work goes into test knitting and it's one of the ways I can say thank you to test knitters um, because test knitters are heroes people. Um, they do a lot of work for very little reward um, but it's really nice to have people out there who will test things and you know be super helpful with feedback. Um, and you know, as a tech editor as well as a designer, I really appreciate the insight of, tech, of test knitters because they might spot things that as a tech editor you won't spot until the needles are actually in your hand. And yeah, it's one of those things, it's quite interesting. Um, but yes, second finished object is a cute little beanie. It looks really small here, it looks tiny. Um, this is again using my yarn, um, it's my Mendip 4 ply, so I've used, I've designed this one to sort of show off my colour pairs because I had the Mendip yarn, I have two bases, so there's a white base and a coloured base and I'd, I dye the same colours on both bases so you get these colour pairs and I wanted to sort of show them off. Um, so it's super cute, it's got these little cables. Um, I'm writing up the pattern for this one at the moment and I'm trying to work out how best to chart the cables. I think I'm going to have to make my own, I think I'm going to have to customise the charts heavily in Illustrator or something, um, but I think it's super cute. Um, so as well as using my own yarn, this one I'm set, like, it. I think the whole hat uses 40 grams of yarn. It's less than 10 grams of the two blue colours here and less than 20 grams of each of the greens. Um, and so I'm also going to be recommending it as a scrap project. So if you've got any ends of yarn you want to use up, um, then it'll be great for those. And obviously you can also make it in just two colours rather than the four colours. So just a light colour and a dark colour. Uh, and just don't worry about the this bit, just carry on with the same ones. Um, so again this one will be opening for testing probably next week um, and again the same will apply with the yarn discount so if you want to preemptively sign up you can go to the test knitting page that I'll link um, and there's a little form there where you can sign up to the mailing list to be notified when the pattern is out for testing. Uh, and this one I'm going to be putting out kits of mini skeins for so that you don't have to buy like four whole 50 gram skeins because it's just not necessary. Um, so yeah. I also, I like how it fits. It's really cute. It does make me want long hair again because I have to like do a thing with my fringe so I don't look like a bald person. Um, but yeah. As you can see, I'm going through a big green and blue phase. So now I'm going to show you what I'm working on at the moment. Um, I have surprisingly few things on the needles. Um, I've got a couple of projects that I've been working on for quite a while that need finishing off. 
Um, one of them I'm hoping to get done in the next few weeks, I think. Um, but that one's been kind of on hold for a while. Uh, so when I start working on that one again, I will show you. Um, this one is a new cast on, uh, which I started at the weekend. So over the uh, Christmas holidays, so I took quite a break over um, Christmas and New Year and tried to get some time away from the computer screen because I had been spending a lot of time at the computer. Um, so I just took my grid paper notebook and spent a long time scribbling and sketching and coming up with little charts. And two of those became the shawl and hat that I showed you that I've just finished off. And this is another one. Um, this is not in my own yarn. This is yarn dyed by Moleview yarn. Um, so it's naturally dyed, uh, I think. This one's dyed with lac, but I can't remember. Um, but it's this gorgeous colour, like it's it's very much a me colour. It's um, sort of true to form, like kind of orange, but kind of also corally pinky. Like it's, it's really pretty. Um, it's the British DK, which is um, Blueface Lester and Massam. And so it's just gonna be like this slap G hat, we've got some two, uh, one by one twisted rib um, and then these little diagonal details that kind of make it look like a crown which I really like um, and then these little bits of rib going up here um, so that one's going to be really sweet I, yeah, I'm looking forward to finishing that one because I don't actually have a warm coloured hat like I have one that has some, some red on it um, but I I like all the warm colours and I, I I have turned up to places before saying yeah I came dressed as the spirit of autumn because you know I'm wearing orange and red and brown and maybe a little bit of green but I just love my autumnal colours and so it feels like I should just complete the set. Uh, so that's going to be that one. Uh, next up is like such a tiny bit of a project. Um, oh. So this is literally a tubular cast on and a couple of rows of corrugated ribbing um, attached to teeny little balls of yarn. So these are just leftovers um, from other projects. So this is again my Mendip yarn um, and I am designing a little colour work hairband for subscribers of my newsletter um, because you know, they listen to me blether on about a lot of the stuff I do and I feel like they should get something for being in there. Um, so this, like I really like these two colours together. I don't know if you can really see, but it's like this quite bright orange, which is the light orange I used on my zigzag mittens, um, which if you've watched the podcast before, you will probably remember. Um, so that one well, it'll be finished quite soon because it's a really, really small project. Uh, and then I am planning to cast on something that I said I would cast on months ago. So I tech edited a pattern for Verena Kors, who is a sustainablist co on Instagram and Ravelry. Um, and one of the early patterns she sent me was a jumper called Cronblad, which is a yoked it's a yoked jumper with geometric details um, which is like I really really like and I want to do more yoked jumpers and I've done some swatching and it works out perfectly um, with my Mendip yarn which is technically a four ply but if you use US measures it works out as sort of a sport weight. Um, so these two balls are left over from the hat that I made uh, with the cables. So I'm going to start off with these ones. Um, I'll probably require another skein or two of the light blue and then this will be the main colour. And I'll see if I can put a little picture in here um, so that you can see the design. But it's going to be super pretty and I'm really looking forward to that. 
and then I'm also planning a DK weight cardigan in navy blue and grey that I'm going to design. Um, I already know roughly what it's going to look like because I started making a jumper out of the yarn uh, that was a design but I started it a long time ago and then I stopped working on it, worked on a lot of other things, learned a lot of things in the meantime and then when I went back to it decided that actually I wasn't happy with the way it was going to turn out and so I undid basically like all of the back and most of the front of the jumper um, so I'm going to reuse that yarn and make a cardigan and it's going to be really pretty uh, I should have bought the yarn to show you um, but yeah I'll show you in the next podcast episode um, so I, yeah I have fewer things on the needles at the moment than I usually do like usually I have at least six and this all feels very manageable and sensible um, because I worked monogamously on the last two projects so I wouldn't let myself work on anything else before those were finished um, so I did the shawl and then started working on the hat finished the hat um, it was terribly boring like it really was I, I, I like working on a variety of things um, and the shawl like is nice it's a nice knit but it's not interesting knitting it's not designed to be interesting knitting it's designed to be mindless knitting and so when I was wanting to work on something to actually take my mind off things and concentrate on a bit it's like no I've got to finish the shawl and so yeah screw that I'm not going to do monogamous knitting anymore I, I didn't think it was going to be for me and it's it's just really really not so I'm just casting on loads of stuff now it's going to be loads of fun so I'll keep you posted on those things so I thought I would just show you um, a little bit of what I'm knitting. So this is the one that's going to be the headband. I've stopped doing the ribbing, so I just did a couple of little rows of the corrugated ribbing, which is quite cute. Um, and now I'm switching to the stranded colour work. And a few episodes ago I did a video on how I was doing the stranded colour work for the sleeves on this jumper. Uh, and I was doing, I was using a Norwegian thimble. So you have for continental knitting you have the two strands of yarn over the left hand finger um, and you have a little thimble here that keeps the strands separated. For this one I am experimenting with one doing continental for one strand and English for the other strand and I didn't do this to start with because the way I was doing English and the reason I switched to continental originally was because my English technique was so bad uh, so I was holding my yarn like this and then like slingshotting like that um, and just constantly flexing that finger ended up being really bad for my wrist so I'm now trying to hold the yarn more as I do for continental um, and I'm still very slow at it um, but so I'm fumbling a little but I actually get on much better doing it like this and whereas um, when I was doing both strands over the left finger um, there are occasional tension issues where if you're using one colour more than the other you end up with too much slack or too tight stitches for one of the colours um, and, but this seems to be helping with that which is pretty exciting because it means that you can, you have more control over individual tension of each of the yarns. And I've done something wrong here. So I am occasionally having to drop the yarn in the right hand just to regain tension on it because I'm still not very good at maintaining a constant tension but I'm getting the hang of it and it's one of those things where like 
I like to be able to do things quickly and when I know that I can do them quickly it's quite difficult to force myself to slow down so that I can try something new and potentially improve long term but this is going quite nicely some work to do on maintaining tension properly on this yarn but generally I'm fairly pleased with this and I think I'm going to stick with trying to improve this um, but yeah we'll see how it goes so as those of you following me on Instagram or on my blog or newsletter or pretty much anywhere where I'm posting at the moment. As you probably know, um, I'm really into natural dyeing at the moment. It took me a long time to get back into it. I started natural dyeing quite a few years ago and then didn't really go anywhere with it because I, you know, I was focusing most of my dyeing efforts on creating my colourways. Um, but now it's something that I'm getting well, I'm, I'm doing a lot more of, and I'm doing it in a slightly more systematic way. So I'm experimenting, but also doing some dyeing that I know will go well. Um, as I talked about in the last one, so I did a big batch of tea dyed yarn, which just came out such a pretty colour. Um, and so I am... Um, trying to do mostly dyeing from forage things so things that I find um, in nature that mostly that are growing in some abundance I don't want to take things that there aren't many of um, so I'm seeing what I can do to get colour out of things that I find and one of those things is ivy so I collected a fair amount of ivy um, from hedgerows nearby and you know there's so much of it you can't even put a dent in the amount there is growing um, and I'm going to prepare some dye from it
so the ivy dye both the leaves and berries yielded colors um so i wasn't i ended up with approximately the same amount of weight of both so just over 100 grams of leaves and just over 100 grams of berries um and so i just put one 50 gram skein in each of the pots and so these are the colors that resulted so this was the one in the leaves and this was the one in the berries um the one in the berries i was quite disappointed by when i was looking at it in the pots because oh, it's not really doing much interesting stuff but actually it's a really lovely color it's this sort of it's sort of yellow in some lights but also sort of goldeny beige in others and it's just this very delicate pretty color which i'm quite a fan of um and then this was the leaves which depending on the light can look green but can look yellow can look sort of beigey brown like it's one of the things that i really love about natural dyes is that they look very different depending on the light conditions and how the light hits them um and i find that really exciting and so once these two were dyed there was still quite a bit of color in the water um which is often the case and i like to use up the exhaust where possible so i combined the two pots of dye so the dye from the berries and the dye from the leaves because chuck it all in together um and I decided to experiment with some bundle dyeing, which if you've been following on Instagram, I posted some videos of at the time. And I've also written a blog post about it with some photos so you can see how that went. Um, and these are the yarns that resulted. Um, they're, they're not, they are much less variegated than I was expecting. Um, but that's fine. Like it's all, in the spirit of experiment and learning um, but there are sort of some darker bits and you know there are some speckly bits uh, so you know it's, it's not completely uniform um, but I was really so I bundled up various bits of potential dye stuff in this yarn um and then steamed that and then put the whole lot in um in the leftover ivy dye pot um and so i was expecting the outside to come out somewhat similar to these two but it came out this glorious yellow which i was slightly surprised by but i think that must be because of some of the things that i had inside the bundle so i had willow in there and i suspect the willow has done something to warm up the color um i do have a big pot of willow steeping out on the decking out the back um i'm just kind of leaving that to stop i've i've put boiling water over it and i'm just leaving it to steep to see what color comes out I've also tried, just up the road there is an alder tree um, and there are always cones on the floor because it's very windy up here so a lot of them fall and so I tend to just grab a few as I pass and so I did a batch of dye with alder cones and these are just glorious like it's the most amazing colour, it's this sort of golden brown um, here it just looks yellow if I get the actual yellow so you can compare it's sort of this lovely rich like not quite tan it's a bit too yellow and not quite orange enough to be tan um that's it next to the ivy dyes but it's just so yummy it's this really nice color um and with this one i've also got a couple more skeins upstairs um I decided so I've also been brewing up some modifiers um, so you can use different metals to modify the colour of the yarn and so this one is one of those very same skeins um, which I tried to go for a bit of a variegated effect and again it's come out quite subtly 
but I, this is from the same dye batch as this, um, that I then put in an iron bath and it's come out like very almost black and I didn't put it in the iron for long because it can, um, it can damage the wool. So it was in there a very short time um, and it's just the most amazing sort of deep like grey, greeny, brown, sort of faded black and it's amazing like look at those colours together like that's such a fun combination and so yeah that was very exciting so I'm looking forward to trying out more modifiers to see how the colours shift because this is something that I've not done I've always just used an alum mordant with cream of tartar and I've occasionally added you know nails locally um, for little grey splotches or slight modification of colour like iron on avocado can turn purple uh, whereas avocado on its own is usually a sort of orangey pink um, so it's just fascinating to see how the colours turn out and so yeah so these ones there will be I think four skeins total of this available on the shop um, I'm, I don't think I'm going to sell the one-off skeins on the website I'm not sure I I might just keep them for experimenting and things mm, but we'll see um, but I am putting together a little range of naturally dyed yarns and I've been trying to work out how to present them on the website because I want it to be clear to people which colours are synthetically dyed and which colours are plant dyed so I do have a category for plant dyed yarns now um, so that it'll be super obvious where I've not used synthetic dyes because I know um, like I don't really have a problem with synthetic dyes because they are fairly inert so that as long as you're careful about like when you're actually dying careful about breathing and making sure you don't actually inhale any of the dye powder um, and try not to get loads of the colour in the water system like it's the dyes are fairly innocuous like they're not toxic um, I mean obviously you don't want to eat them but they're they're not too problematic um, but I do want to get more colour from local things because you know I'm very proud of the fact that uh, these yarns are from a local farm uh, less than half an hour away um, I know the farm personally you know they work very closely with nature they use the sheep to regenerate the land um, and I think natural dyeing using local plants is a way to kind of stick with that kind of holistic approach which I quite like that all sounds a bit hippie-ish but I I do really like knowing where things are coming from and you know my yarn is come is called Mendip and you know I'd, I'd like to have it be a truly local thing which I quite like um, so yeah keep tuned for more natural dyed things I'm gonna give you a quick look at the lichen dye that I prepared last time because it's done some really interesting stuff I'm not going to use it yet I'm gonna let it steep probably for another couple of months because I'm fascinated to see what happens but I'll give you a quick update on that in a second so these are the two jars of lichen dye I prepared last time um, this one I've had to transfer into a bigger jar um, because I felt like it needed it um, so this one I've had a look into which lichens they might be and I've had some useful advice from people and so I think this one might be Palmatrema perlatum, which is the bigger, flat, more leafy lichen where there were some pieces that were sort of that big. Um, and then this one, I believe, is oak moss. Um, so I can show you. So last time, you know, they were green slush in the water. Um, and here... I don't know if you can see that colour there. 
it is a very deep sort of reddy orange we've got all our lichen still in there so in case you missed the last episode um, this is lichen that I've crushed up and is soaking in an ammonia water mixture um, solution I suppose and I've got the windows open and I'm being quite careful not to breathe this because uh, it smells to high hell um, but yeah so that's fascinating it's I mean like it could just stay this colour and I'd be quite happy um, apparently it could turn purple with time so we will see um, so this is the one that actually didn't really do much when I mixed it up but this one um, when I first mixed it immediately started sort of frothing um, and looking quite noxious so I left it open for a while um, I don't know if you'll be able to see there but it's just gone a very very deep rich brown um, it's quite gross lichen itself has all just gone black um, so that is the colour there it's just very very dark if I put a tiny bit on this bit of paper here um, so that's oh, which way are we going that's the colour there um, that other bit there is where I rested the spoon from the other one um, so that one is this one's slightly more orangey and then this one is just a very dark brown um, which is interesting again I'm going to leave it to steep quite a while longer um, I think probably another couple of months so it's been in there a month so far um, and then we'll see if they change further and if not I'll use them on some wool and see how that goes so yes I'm very fascinated to see how this progresses thank you so much for watching uh, it's always a pleasure to talk about what I've been up to and I hope you found it interesting um, if you want to keep up with what I'm up to between podcast episodes because they're every month you can find me on Instagram and Ravelry. I'm Marina Skewer on both. You can also find me on Facebook, but I'm not super active there. Uh, you can also go to the website where I've got a blog where I post every few weeks. Um, and you can also sign up for the newsletter on the website. So that's on www.marinaskewer.com. And for now, I will leave you with some more nice snowy scenes. So bye until next time.